our engagement and marketing panel that David has pulled together. Um, I have just the very most brief information about our three panelists on this slide. Um, and you can look at that. And I want to take it down in just a second. And then I'll let David actually do more of the introduction. He's really the expert here. So all right. Take it away whenever you'd like. Oh, take it away whenever I want. Okay. Wow. That's a, <laughs> wow. And I've even for, uh, forgotten what all I had typed up that's out, out in the notes, but I just feel like we're kind of getting together for a family chat is what this <laughs> kind of feels like. And uh, the rest of you are going to listen in and ask questions if you want to. And, uh, but th these are uh, three of my favorite people, three of my favorite individuals, I think very, very skilled in these areas of engagement and marketing, uh, coming at it from very seemingly different uh, perspectives and different approaches, which I think is valuable on a panel. And so I don't want to spend too much time on introductions, I guess, because I think you'll learn more about them as we talk through this. But just to highlight and why they're involved here, uh, uh, Jennifer uh, Prophet is with the uh, Hopeful Neighborhood Project which is headquartered in St. Louis. And I think you'll learn more about that as we talk through that uh, and how her skill set matches up with our topic. And uh, Deborah, I think, is on Zoom with us from Michigan uh, this evening. Yep. And uh, so <laughs> I, I want to use the word whiz bang in describing uh, Deborah, but uh, Deborah is energetic. Uh, she is much younger than I am, so she she thinks of things and looks at things differently, which can be a great thing. And she's also really tech savvy. And we've talked a lot about using technology to connect neighbors. And she's working on a really kind of innovative project uh, to do that type of thing. So I think she has a very unique perspective on this topic as well. And then Samuel Knox, I noticed that Samuel's on. He is the uh, editor and founder of Unite Publications in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, gosh, I think he's probably been at that for 30 years, I would say at least, maybe longer than that. I don't, I don't see his video popping up yet. He's here, I can see him. Oh, okay. All right. And uh, so... <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't know how Samuel would, would describe Unite exactly. I th it began, um, I believe, solely as a newspaper. It's the African American focused newspaper in Springfield, Missouri. But he really does a lot more than that. <laughs> uh, events and also an online platform. I think he's expanded into some of those areas um, and has some, I think, unique approaches to marketing his events and engaging with the community. And because of his wealth of experience, I just think it'd be really valuable to hear from him as well. So I just, I really appreciate the three of them joining us this evening for panel discussion. And I think uh, we have a few set questions, but also the advantage of having three individuals like this together is uh, asking questions yourself from the class participants. So uh, we'll just get going, Jennifer and Deborah and Samuel. Thank you for joining us tonight. And we have people on from all across Missouri that are looking to improve their leadership skills and their work in their communities. Uh, so let's just kind of go down the line. Let's tell me a little bit about your uh, work and how it relates to community engagement and marketing of events. Jennifer, you want to kick us off? Um. So I want to start by giving a Missouri shout out because I just drove all over Missouri two weeks ago with my kids and it was just, I was, it just felt really good to be driving through both big and small places in Missouri. I took some roundabout roads along with 70 and so I just want to shout out that I, I appreciate you the, the large and small places that you're all working in community. Um, so just thanks for that. <laughs> I was feeling Missouri proud. Um, so I am the community, uh, the director of community programming for uh, the Hopeful Neighborhood Project. Um, and what our goal is in the Hopeful Neighborhood Project is to encourage and equip everyday people to kind of live into their 
their role as a neighbor. So, you know, lots of times in leadership development or other circles, you're thinking about how do I going to be in a good employee or this or that. And sometimes we forget that like living as a neighbor and community is a really um, important and valuable role. And I think that was really brought home some in some ways in the pandemic, because all of a sudden you looked around and you said, if I need toilet paper, <laughs> I, there's six houses that I'm going to have to beg <laughs> or borrow or steal, but, you know, begging is much easier. <laughs> so um, I think that just really brought that home. So anyway, um, how that then relates to marketing and engagement uh, is that we, we try to help people kind of be thinking about how to how to use their gifts with their neighbors and uh, do do some good. So we need to market our organization, which is relatively young on one hand. So there's some marketing um, and engagement with with that to to engage people in what we're doing. Um, but then we are also helping uh, equip those people who want to do something and encourage them in getting their event or their project out in the community as well. So there's kind of two sides to marketing that I'm always thinking about. One is how do how do I let people know about what we're doing, but then also when we have someone working with us, how to how do I equip and encourage and how do we coach them in, you know, marketing what they're doing, which is really the role probably many of you are playing in is I'd like to do this thing, but how do I get the others around me and my community involved? Um so that is a brief introduction. Okay. Let me fire you a, sh a short question. You get to give a short answer. Okay. What's your What's your favorite marketing tool? Um, or technique? Social ads. Social yeah. ads. Okay. All right. I mean, uh, I could say a lot more, but I'm pro I'm going to keep it short. That's what you said. That, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I have one other technique that it might be a better a, another favorite. And I'll talk about it more, but tapping into people's gifts. That's like the personal engagement thing that works the best. And just the actual tool for marketing, I would say my favorite is social ads. Okay. There you go. There we go. De uh, Deborah, how about uh, how about you? Sure. Yeah. And Jennifer, I want to hear more about your social ad strategy, actually. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, okay. like, maybe that's for, for later. Yeah. So um, I... I'm working on an initiative called Common Agency. Um, we are the baby of this group for sure. Um, just registered this year and we're launching kind of our first pilots right now. So you, you're catching me at an interesting time. Um, so what our purpose is to try to strengthen democracy and working towards shared ownership of the USA. So we're looking at a little bit more around decision-making and how do groups come together for collective action. Um, and this was driven because, um, I mean, I, I don't know how y'all are feeling right now during this uh, election season, but it seems like I'm receiving a lot of mail and text messages just kind of like, I don't know, ramming at me down my throat that I need to vote and like who I'm supposed to vote for and how everything is terrible and how everything can be great, all this stuff that makes me actually feel really powerless and really like hopeless actually about like what my role in this this space could be like. And so what we're trying to do is think how instead of doing these kind of in like is it this is this is a type of marketing right this is a type of campaigning which is very kind of one-off episodic just sudden like one time come in and be like hey we're just here right now and then everyone disappears what we're trying to do is build something where actually there'll be more kind of um two-way engagement that lasts longer where it feels like you know where it feels like we're we're building something together to communicate together about these different events and about what's happening in the community instead of this kind of like one way street, if that makes sense. So the basic premise of what I'm doing is, is kind of building like these neighborhood networks. Um, and by neighborhood, I mean just the geographic boundary of spaces where it feels like meeting up in person does not feel like it has to be a big production, right? Because I know in rural communities, it's very different than in a lot of urban communities in terms of what that frame of reference is. And so what we do is um, there are other networks, digital networks like this that exist, right? But they're very focused on um, kind of the, the online engagement, screen engagement. They want you to stay online because that's how their business models function. That's, that's their choice. What we're trying to do is think, can we actually just use the online tools a way to almost do some matchmaking between different neighbors to be able to meet up and try to like catalyze more unexpected connections over shared interests and ideas. 
and um, I can get more into like the more mechanics of it later if that's useful, but that's our general premise and how we're approach how we look at the whole marketing thing. Yeah. I love the idea of matchmaking with neighbors and that overshared interest that kind of gets to the gifts even that, that Jennifer was talking about, but it gets to some of our earlier discussion about, you know, how how do I find someone else in the neighborhood to help me with this project? How do I find a, a volunteer? But uh, so I love the whole approach. You have a, it's like you have a question up, Tammy. Tammy yeah, posted. Deborah. I missed it, but I'm trying to take a few notes. You you said st strength and democracy, and you said um, how do groups come together? And I, the second part of that oh, is how, how do groups how do groups do what? I'm sorry. How do they make decisions? Make decisions. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. So David just shared an interesting link, which um, is a lot of the research that I've been doing the past few years is interviewing folks who are neighborhood leaders. Um, I called them block stewards. So people who just spend extra time taking care of like building social cohesion and building social fabric of those around them. And what I realized then is a lot of the, one of the biggest challenges for a lot of these block stewards was being able to connect more with people who are not block stewards in, the, in their neighborhoods um, and how to really engage people to to also want to get involved in the kind of this kind of co-creation of the social fabric and strengthening and strengthening how we come together. And so that's where this idea was kind of birthed from is from that research there, mm -hmm. um, realizing that uh, the like to me, a good way to do that is by um, encouraging more kind of small groups to get together and work on ideas together. And even if they're not working together and they're just talking and meeting and just making new friendships, that I think can lead to the action that can actually happen. I think a lot about like the importance of re strong relational soil in a community. And then that soil is when you can start planting seeds of action, right? And then if the seeds of action work out well, the roots will of course nourish the soil even more to be healthier. So what we're looking for is kind of that. I see the, the, those two types of um, outcomes kind of working together. Okay, enough of my soapbox. <laughs> oh, that's a great, yeah, that's a great metaphor. That's a great image. I love that. That's very memorable. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, David. <laughs> um, and Samuel Knox, I'm not, uh, like I said, his video is not popping up for me, but uh, Samuel Knox is here in Springfield, Missouri, but we have to be, we have to use Zoom to actually meet, uh, meet up face to face. So uh, Samuel, how are you? Thank you for joining us this evening. and. Uh, Share, share a little bit of your story and how it relates to your work and how it relates to community engagement and marketing of events. Sure. Thank you first, David, for inviting me to this forum. I really appreciate it. And David has been a friend for a long time. So I, I really appreciate oh. the, the reconnection and to, to do it on Zoom. We live in the same city. But <laughs> <laughs> We're meeting by Zoom tonight. But uh, thanks again for the invitation. Yes. You know, I, I think you've done a great job in, in the introduction. I am the founder, uh, co-founder of the uh, uh, Unite of Southwest Missouri, which is the founder of the Unite News publication. And we've been consistently uh, publishing news and informational resources targeting our local African-American community uh, in the Springfield area for over 30 years. And uh, it's been a great uh, run. And, uh, and included with that, uh, we also are doing some uh, community festivals and uh, some uh, workshops in the community as well, which uh, allows us to uh, engage with uh, a targeted audience, but then a more of a general audience as well in terms of uh, some of our uh, uh, resources that uh, we're connecting with the community on. Uh, it's, you know, it's, my background is ad agency and a part, and then I evolved and, and moved into the newspaper uh, area. And uh, both of those areas have kind of informed my process of engaging and connecting with people uh, with the organization that I work with now. So uh, it's kind of the nuts and bolts of the things that to kind of uh, behind the scenes, I, I think the technical part is 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 as important as the social connection that we have with people as well, and mm -hmm. how to uh, connect in a way that uh, uh, allows people to uh, get to know you. You know, people do business with people they know, like, 
And uh, uh, I, I believe that uh, that's a part of developing relationships to move, you know, whatever we're working with, uh, whatever topic, uh, whether it's a political uh, topic or whether it's just a community topic, uh, we like to uh, think engage engagement as community. Uh, we're, even though I work with a, a very narrow part of our community, the African-American community here in Springfield is 4%. And, uh, and out of 170,000 people, you know, that's kind of a drop in the bucket. But uh, we're very engaged and uh, resourceful in terms of uh, uh, sharing news and information and inform the entire community, really. Uh, we have a lot more readers outside of our direct mm. target area. And, uh, but uh, uh, we enjoy uh, the work that we do. We enjoy connecting with people in the area and we really are proud about this, the, the progress that we've had in the Southwest Missouri uh, part of the state as well. Well, you're, you're right. It may be 4%, but very engaged, it seems. Absolutely. And uh, so do you, <clears throat> I don't think I asked this of Deborah, but I did of Jennifer. Do you have a uh, favorite technique or tool for uh, reaching people? You know, I'm old school, so I, I use some of the, <laughs> some of the older methods. Uh, you know, I, I'm still a person that uses flyers and posters and sometimes postcards, uh, but I use a lot of email and uh, that's, that's kind of my preferred way to, to uh, connect with people. But I, hey, I'm not opposed to just uh, using the telephone to connect and give people a call. Yeah. I, that still works. Well, eat. Email's easy on the budget, um, although although placing an ad in Unite is also very budget friendly. So <laughs> absolutely. Uh, <laughs> well, um, that, and I I do know that class members and stuff. You guys can jump in with questions uh, anytime you want. I don't think I have to tell you that. Uh, I figure you will as you hear something of interest to you or something you want expanded upon. So. Uh, and we'll kind of change the order up this time. We'll go. We'll go with uh, uh, Deborah first, and then Samuel second, and Jennifer third on this one. Uh, so, what do you think is the what's the best way to reach an audience, especially in a community or neighborhood? Is there mm -hmm. a, is there a trick or a special method? What what is the best way to go about doing that? <laughs> Well, David, I think that I think the trick is building relationships. Um, it's kind of what Samuel had just said, right? People do business with people they know and like. Um, and I think Jennifer was about to touch on it with just talking about gifts and things. And so I, I think it's important to try to um, try to just build connections. And it's slow. It's patient work. And I think that's the important part. And um, like what we're doing with common agencies, we're trying to build something where um we're trying to see, can we create a messenger that's actually trusted, right? Because um, I believe that the messenger is almost as important as the message itself. Um, if Samuel calls me to tell me something, I'll be like, yeah, <laughs> like I believe it because he's telling me something. Um, if Facebook tells me something, I don't know if I believe it as much <laughs> because I don't know if I have as much trust in that in that messenger anymore. Yeah. So what we're doing with common agency is, you know, building up like consistent, uh, like the mechanism we use is um, basically uh, if people sign up to join this network, they would receive one question a week from a fellow neighbor. Um, and so it's supposed to be like a slow buildup once a week, easy to um, get and, and not too much of a burden, not spammy, um, but consistent over time. So people feel like there is this, it becomes a, a way of something that people can rely on that will just come every week and it will be from a different neighbor. Not every week, but, you know, over time will be from different neighbors. Yeah. I, I have a friend that says na neighboring relationships is like a crock pot, not a microwave. Mm, so exactly. it's a slow, it's a slow cook. And you're, you're describing that in, in your own unique way uh, with, with technology, it being a process, <laughs> certainly building up to that. I see uh, GK has a hand up for a question. Yeah, can you give us an exa a quick example of an idea of what a question from a neighbor might be or what that would look like? Sure, thanks GK. So um, a 
few weeks ago, this is kind of unexpected. We had a neighbor named Nikki who sent out a message on our little network. And it oh, also this goes out to either text or email. There's not like an, another app or something. It just goes to a text or email to keep it easy. And she sent out this message that just said like, hey, it's Nikki, um, day that is coming up. Um, it's a way to celebrate your loved ones. And then she actually shared a story about how she celebrate the passing of her loved ones, which was very sweet. And then, um, then the question of the week was, you know, how do you celebrate the passing of your loved ones? And it kind of gave people a chance to engage with the with a the holiday they might not be as familiar with. It also gave uh, Nikki a chance to be a little vulnerable and share something about herself. And then the answers we got were some of them were quite beautiful. One shared about this like children's story called Invisible Strings, where she talks about how she tells she works with her kids, uh, or she tells her kids that when they feel grief. And when when they miss somebody, it's actually it's actually like kind of pulling on an invisible string to like with their connection with with the person who has passed, and it was just like a very beautiful beautiful one. So that's like one example. That one's more kind of like a a way to connect connection question I would say. And then more recently, we've sent out some messages around this particular park in the in the area. One. Um, asking about like what's a favorite memory you've had in this park and then a lot of people share kind of negative memories because I guess it's not it's a it's a park that might need some cleanup <laughs> and then so the next week we ask you know like what might be some suggestions you have for the park <laughs> just to kind of get that out there as well so it really varies and we're trying to keep it varied um, intentionally but the the idea oh the Michelle it's cool that your your daughter loves that book anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> But the idea and approach here is you're not overwhelming people with something every day, right? You know, and yeah. but but you are continuing to chip away at it at a regular inter interval. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then we're hoping um, as we keep going, um, we want to see if there will be commonalities across people's answers. And then if there are, we will want to send some emails out and say like, hey, you know, you're all in, you four people, you're all interested in community gardens or whatever, you know, um, do you want to, do you want to meet up and, and, and talk about it? And maybe again, maybe they just talk about gardening tips with each other, or maybe they build a whole garden, a whole community garden, who knows, or maybe they make a community land trust because they're real intense, <laughs> but you know, you never know. You never know. <laughs> All right, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Samuel, what, uh, from your perspective, what's the best way to reach an audience, especially in a community or neighborhood? And, you know, in your sense, Springfield bigger, but you may be thinking of your own neighborhood or the audience that you focus on even. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I'm going to give you three examples. Uh, one is uh, we do an annual event, which is the Springfield Multicultural Festival. Oh, yeah. And uh, it's very important or what has been really important for our organization in terms of getting out the word is we've connected with an influencer, a very powerful influencer, uh, which is one of the largest television stations in the area, which is KY3. Yeah. And uh, they have a very regional uh, presence in the Southwest and Northern Arkansas area. So uh, on an annual basis, we connect with them. They help us with lots of PSAs, uh, over about a month period gearing up toward our event that's held every year in January. Now, we just recently had a workshop that, a brand new workshop that we presented to our, our particular uh, targeted audience uh, along the lines of health and wellness. And we were starting a very brand new initiative and we were trying to engage our community uh, to attend an event, a kickoff event. Uh, it was very important that we started well ahead of time. That helped a, a lot. But we engaged, again, with utilizing influencers. Uh, we connected with our area pastors, uh, and uh, we invited them to a breakfast. It's always good when you have a meeting to have food there. And uh, so on a Saturday morning, early Saturday morning, we invited uh, a group of pastors, got them engaged with uh, our uh, initiative, our health initiative, they were very, you know, uh, receiving of our information, started sharing stories, of own personal stories about health uh, and wellness. And we asked them, you know, could you influence about five families to attend our event? Our event uh, that was probably about a month out from there. Uh, we had started much further ahead of that 
in terms of getting out some information. We had a website uh, where you could sign up online or register. And we had an idea of who was coming. And then we could use those emails to then inform uh, those same folks of uh, details about the event as it, we got closer to the event. And surveys are really important as well. Once you get uh, a captive audience, uh, those surveys to kind of ask them, you know, uh, some very specific questions will kind of help inform how you market to them in the future. Uh, and another way, on a monthly basis with our United News publication, we, we talk to our same audience every month. And uh, we now, where our publication was just print only, now we have an online presence uh, where there is a digital uh, form of our publication online. But uh, we're even looking now to kind of expand a little bit more into an app where we could push out information to our uh, particular audience. Uh, there's just so much new technology that I'm having to learn. Uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm old school, but <laughs> I'm surrounding myself with a team of young people that are really informing me about how we can better connect and engage with our audience and even build our audience with new technology that uh, is coming available. So, you know, those are th three really great examples. And I said, just because I, it's in my area, so I'm familiar with them, but you mentioned the multicultural festival to begin with, and you're right. That's a big event and a big undertaking, but KY3 treats that like it's their own. I mean, I mean that in a very positive way. I mean, they have been a long time supporter and promoter of that. And that's, man, that was, that's probably due to relationship, relationships, relationships on your part. It has been. And in relationship is really important. Uh, and they have been a media partner of ours probably for over 10 years. Uh, and uh, again, uh, there are, I think we've become over time really good about developing uh, partners in the media and influencers in the community that can help us push our message uh, forward uh, within the entire community and especially toward our target audience as well. Uh, yeah. I can't talk enough about how important a team uh, of influencers are uh, to help your effort. Yeah, I, lo I love that you use that word, influencers are Sometimes it, people talk about opinion leaders. I mean, it's the same same thing, but locating those people, those individuals in your neighborhood or the city that can really influence other people. They're, the first, they're, they're not always the first ones to accept a new idea <laughs> sometimes, but the, the power of having them on your team uh, to help promote, that's, I don't think that's something we have talked about much in this class. And that's a really, really great point to remember. Um, and I and I love your examples of how that has been a success, how you've been able to pull pull that off. I would guess some of your influencers uh, not only do they drive your attendance, like your health event, but they may end up like KY three being a long term partner as well. So there can be some great benefits of doing that approach. Great examples. Jennifer. Yeah, well. You haven't been sucked into a game with your children yet, it looks like. So. Nope, nope. So far, so good. The <laughs> dragon, the roaring of dragon is still keeping them entertained. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have kids. Dragons are all the rage. You should. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so I had like three things. And the first one you're not going to be surprised to hear um, is to invite people and know them personally, relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, so that was my first one. Um, I, my little, you know, kind of tag that I wrote down is the majority of people come to something because someone they know invited them. That's the majority of, of motivation. So 
I'm not going to mention that anymore because that's been mentioned. Both influencers and just relationship with people and that personal invite is, you know, really important for, mm -hmm. uh, for reaching an audience. Um, my next point, though, is uh, maybe opposite of that, but also still important is you have to kind of, you know, you have to get the word out in a mass way as well because you meet more people that way. <laughs> and so um, my tip for that is to just be sure you're looking for where the people are. Um, so thinking about where your audience is and then making the word, like, you know, getting the word out on that place. So if you're in a kind of typical neighborhood subdivision, maybe everybody's on next door and that's where you need to be to get your message out because people are, you know, on that as a, an app or way to gather. Maybe there's a neighborhood Facebook group. If you're reaching not young people, maybe it's TikTok or another, I just learned about one called Be Real, or maybe there's another social media platform, or maybe it's texting then for them. Maybe there's a coffee shop that everybody goes to, and that's where you want to make sure you get a poster out. So it doesn't have to be high tech, but just really think through where is your audience? Where are they gathering? If you're in a small town, it might be in my small town where I grew up, it was Daylight Donuts, and that's where I worked. So if you wanted, if you wanted everyone to know about it, make sure like the 10 a.m. West Side coffee table knew about it. <laughs> They'd get the word out. <laughs> um, so you know, just thinking through where are the people and that's where you, that's the, that's the platform you use. I think sometimes it's easy to think I should use the newest strategy or I should, this organization had a lot of success using this thing. It's only successful if that's where your people actually are. So Facebook is another, it's a really good example of that, I think, because like we don't do much on Facebook at the Hopeful Neighborhood Project because it's just not where our people are. We have a Facebook page, we do some advertising, but all of it sends to the website because our audience just doesn't hang out on that as a platform. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't, we, we just because it's easy, it doesn't mean it's the one we necessarily use. Um, so that's, that's that. And then the final one that I mentioned it before is to really focus on giftedness. And this goes again to relationship, but it goes a little deeper than just knowing who a person is, um, like by their name, but actually engage them by knowing what they're good at. Um, I think a lot of times with volunteer work, we do something like we make a plan, a couple of people, and then we think of the 15 jobs that need to be done. And we go out and we ask 15 people to do those jobs. Um, and that is fine. <laughs> but if it's a hard job for you, if it's just a volunteer effort, you might not be as willing to do it. Whereas if you looked, if you started before you created an event and said, what are the gifts we have in this neighborhood? What are the gifts we have in this organization? You know, what are, what are the gifts in our volunteer base? And then created something linking all those gifts together. Now you're asking people to actually do something that's easy and fun for them. Um, so like if you ask me to do phone calls, even if I say yes, it's going to be torture and I'm never going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> or it's not going to go as well because that is a really hard thing for me as an introvert. If you ask me to, you know, write something for you um, or create a project for kids, now I'm going to be all over that. I'll probably have it done tomorrow because that's easy and fun for me. Um, and so if you if you're creating your events around what you know the gifts are and then inviting people in just to use their gifts, that's engaging, that's encouraging, and they'll invite their friends, right? Because they feel really good about what they did. So if I'm creating, if I'm using, you know, a tool that I made for kids, well, I already know all the neighborhood kids because that's my gift and that's easy for me. I'm gonna be saying, hey, if you want to decorate cookies at the Christmas thing. <laughs> Why didn't you come over? I made this whole plan. And so, whereas if you just asked me to put flyers on those neighbors' doors, I might agree, but I'm not going to be excited about it. And it's going to be hard for me. And I'm going to put it off till the, till the end. So anyway, that, I see some things in the chat. I don't know if that's, th those are my thoughts about engagement and what we try to coach people through is, you know, don't create the event and then pipe, invite people in, figure out who you've got and, and use their gifts and create things around that. Yeah. You, for, you first have to get to know people, right? And right. listen, yep. and discover what their gifts are. Yes. So that's, that's backing up even a few more steps beyond just uh, connecting with influencers. That's backing up even further from that. Right. To discover right. their gifts. And it, when you invite people in, you know, then they, there's relationships, you know, if you've got 
10 people or 15 people who are using the gifts to do something, they're excited about it. Chances are one of them knows an influencer, even if you don't, <laughs> you know, that you start to really expand the circle out and you've got so much engagement or ownership in the thing um, that it's it's much easier. Yes. Yes. I I have a gentleman in our neighborhood that's really pretty cantankerous and pretty uh, kind of has one of those permanent frowny faces. I think there's a term for that. <laughs> thing. But uh, but again, to know him, I discovered that, and you can tell from his yard, he is really passionate about taking care of his yard. Mm -hmm. And uh, and most people don't talk to him, but he's kind of afraid of him a little bit. And uh, so this spring, I had asked him if we could schedule an event in his neighborhood, and he gave everybody like gardening 101, lawn care 101. And he said, yes. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think we just had seven or eight neighbors show up, but he was really passionate about that. Uh -huh. And that was something that he was interested in doing. And I, I'd have to think back. I'm pretty sure most of these neighbors had never spoken to him before. Cause again, uh, he, he not real warm and fuzzy, but mm -hmm. he had a lot to say about lawn care. He, if I had to ask him to, I don't know, name anything else, I'm sure the answer would have been no. Right. But he was passionate about that and wanted to get to talk about it. So yeah. using that giftedness, that's a, man, that's a great lesson. That's a powerful lesson. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it does, it takes relationship. It takes some time. We've said all that. Um, it's also sometimes easier than you think. So although not everyone wants to volunteer with what they do with their day job, they might be willing to because it's easy for them. So if you if you only know, like that, I know one thing about this next door neighbor, and that is that she has a cleaning company. That is the only thing I know about her. She has two kids and a cleaning company. Um, but she has a company that tells me a lot about her, right? And that she she's connected to a lot of people because it's a cleaning company. So she's in a lot of people's homes. You know, that gives me some thing, even after just like, you know, four conversations walking, <laughs> um, I know a little something about what her gifts might be. And I can build on that. Uh, if I'm having an event, I don't have to know everybody's whole story. Just start with what you know and build, build on that. Ah, uh, yes. Start with what you know. Mm -hmm. Good okay. I, I hope people are taking notes because I, I am, because this has been <laughs> loaded, uh, already and several things to circle back on and remember and to put into practice myself. Uh, great, great advice. Well, the, the third question here, we'll, uh, we'll rotate the order again. We'll begin with Samuel and then we'll hit Jennifer and we'll end with Deborah. Uh, what types of things uh, do neighborhood audiences, I'm saying neighborhood audiences because that's been our focus, but you know, your context, what types of things do neighborhood audiences seem to be interested in right now? Interested in right now? What are you seen as like maybe hot topics or great ways to rally people together or something that neighbors are really clamoring for in the community? That's a good question, David. Um, I live in a neighborhood and I've lived in my neighborhood for about 20, maybe 25, oh. 27 years. Wow. And uh, I know all of my neighbors. I live in a cul-de-sac. And uh, interesting enough, we communicate with most of our neighbors, especially in the summertime, really often, almost on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, we're that close. And uh, we even have what we call our neighborhood uh, night out where we, it's kind of a potluck where when the neighbors, we bring our lawn chairs over to their front yard and we sit out front and and we eat together and share stories. And uh, of course, we all have something in common because we all live in the same neighborhood. And we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about the skunk that comes through every now and then and smells up the neighborhood. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about, you know, uh, you know, the security of our neighborhood as well. Uh, we live very close to kind of a wooded area. And uh, we've had some, uh, some homeless problems uh, in our areas uh, here recently. Uh, the city of Springfield had had made an initiative uh, with the uh, law enforcement and some of the uh, charitable agencies. They were clearing out some homeless camps. And uh, one of them was probably about a half mile from our neighborhood. And uh, it's just a wooded area where they clean out the neighborhood, uh, well, the homeless camp. And, you know, 
the homeless folks, some of them took part in some of the resources that were offered. Some of them didn't. And they seem to migrate toward our neighborhood. And uh, so, you know, we live close to a historic historical park. And so some of that conversation was around the safety of our neighborhood. And uh, and since we're so close knit, you know, we have someone who lives at the entrance of the cul-de-sac and he's he always tells us here, hey, I've got an eye out for who's coming, you know, into the neighborhood because mm -hmm. they can't go out. They can always turn yeah. around and go out the same way that they came in. So uh, that that's one of the conversations, you know, security is, is I think, is probably high on everyone's, you know, uh, talking point. Uh, but, uh, you know, we just spend time talking about, it's a, it's kind of an older neighborhood. We talk about our grandkids and uh, uh, folks, uh, the current events, you know, what's going on uh, on the political scene, not too much because, you know, we want to stay friends. <laughs> <laughs> wise, wise. <laughs> but, but, you know, that that's kind of in general what we talk about. Uh, oh, and one more thing, you know, uh, we have an annual uh, yard sale that we do. And so we coordinate that and we get a lot of, you know, folks that come through because it's kind of a coordinated effort. Uh, we decide to do it at one weekend and everybody participates and uh, we probably get about 80% of the neighborhood participating. Wow. Uh, and I think that's, that's, that's a pretty good number. Yeah. Well, you're, you're my new hero. Not, not <laughs> like you, you, you know all your neighbors, so you're already setting the curve there. And uh, but doing a potluck, doing something like that together, and the yard sale, those are great examples. I um, someone was telling me about, about this a few weeks ago. They do a, a neighborhood yard sale, uh, but the night before the sale begins, it's open to neighbors only. Uh, and isn't that a great idea? I, I yeah. love that. And so it's just the neighbors that come by in the evening and think some do neighbor discounts. I don't know how, you know, uh, my stuff's already priced pretty low anyway. I don't know if I want a discount anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I we, do, I we do bulk pickup after our neighborhood garage sale, which makes me think we're just full of a lot of junk. <laughs> and now that I think about that to say it, I'm like, oh, that doesn't show a whole lot of confidence in our yard sailing, does it? <laughs> But I, but I love that idea and those examples, Samuel. Thank, thank you very much for, for that. Well, Jennifer, you're, you're next, you're next up on that question. Um, yeah, I think um, a couple of things that came to my mind of just what we, what we see as we're in, engaging with people in, in neighboring, um, is that stuff with a short time commitment seems to be really important still. Um, well, important, maybe not still, um, but just important because everyone's lives are so mm. packed. Um, you know, if it's, if you've got kids, then they're packed with kids activities. If you don't have kids, um, then you're either, you know, working a lot, it seems, or you've got these, you know, volunteer things to do. Um, it just seems like everyone's life is really really packed. Um, and so they're, they're nervous about anything that feels like a long time commitment. Um, so I, I see like on my neighborhood Facebook group, you know, like <laughs> an Easter egg hunt for kids or, you know, one time kind of short commitment sort of thing also seems to be what, um, is, is most popular and people engage with us the most on, on our platforms and, and what, um, people are willing to do in other neighborhoods. So although I don't know that that's necessarily ideal, um, if that's what we've got, then that's what we work with. And uh, just think about building those relationships over a series of short kind of one-time commitments. Um, I always say that success breeds success. I don't just say that lots of people say that, <laughs> um, but I try to remember that success breeds success. So if you come to just like one neighborhood yard sale or participate that in that one and you meet the neighbors and it's a positive experience, then when they invite you to the barbecue, you know, the next month, you're more likely to come. Um, so even though it's sometimes discouraging to think about like just one little engagement, um, I do think that a positive one-time engagement um, helps them be able to say yes to the next thing and then the next thing um, until they're really engaged. So short time commitment seems to be important um, and still just very much a reality. And then the other thing that I think is still 
we're we're still recovering um and maybe always will be from from covid from understanding that like gathering has dangers <laughs> um and can be hard and um so offering ways that people can engage still from home in some sort of way, I think is still an important kind of first step in this relationship building. Um, so we, if you popped in before we got off break, Deborah and I were talking about some of the events that we do, which is uh, um, like making, make and take little items for people to give to their neighbors, but they seem to want, they want to connect with their neighbors, but like, let's make this thing at home with our kids. And then we can, we can, we'll go to their front door, but the activity wasn't, let's all come together and make the thing. <laughs> Let me make it in the safety of my own home. And I can, you know, kind of like venture out slowly. That's one of the most popular things that we do. So if you're trying to get engagement in some sort of event, thinking about what are some things that people could volunteer to do at home um, where they feel safe to kind of uh, help increase that yeah. engagement and get them to the point where they feel safe enough or motivated enough to go out of their home <laughs> to do the thing. Um, that just seems to be something that um, is we're still noticing I'm still noticing personally the extroverts that were like dying for the two years of the pandemic aren't always noticing that. And I think they're often neighborhood leaders. <laughs> and so I just say to all of you who might be that, <laughs> there's a lot of people who still want to engage, but are just like, just, it's just slow for them because it was, it, the whole thing was very hard and um, they're introverts and they also kind of like hiding in their house like me <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So bring them in slowly, bring them in slowly. They'll come back, bring them in slowly. <laughs> That's well, those well, are my thoughts. Yeah. And I love your observation about the small, small bites, I guess, right at yeah. a time, not, not, uh, Hey, can we get you to sign up for this year long commitment or, mm -hmm. or even three month commitment? Can, can you participate in a, you know, three week commitment or mm -hmm. something right. even much smaller, much smaller. right. A 30 minute, just stop by for 30 minutes. It'll be fun. Promise. <laughs> well, and that, and that's important too. I get this question a lot about introverts. <laughs> you know, it, uh, one of the strategies with introverts is give them a, a beginning and an ending time. Mm -hmm. yep. Let, you know, if, if your party's two hours, then they may decide to come when it half of it's over, mm -hmm. but they know when the cutoff time is instead of having them come to something that's just open-ended and they don't know how long they're going to be there mm -hmm. uh, and give them a job <laughs> and, give them, and give them a job, give them a job. And that's, uh, you know, I, I guess introverts are about 50% of the population, right? It's about 50, 50 split. So make some of those accommodations. Remember those rules. Uh, Deborah, you're, you're third up this time. What, uh, uh, what additional drops of wisdom do you have for us? I mean, I think Samuel and Jennifer covered so much. So cool. I'm grateful for that. <laughs> Um, I think building on Jennifer's last point here around the introverts, as I am, I am definitely an introvert. And um, one thing I really missed during the the pandemic was, you know, I would I would still have get-togethers with friends on on on, um, on Zoom, right? Um, but I I really miss just like doing stuff together, which is why like during the break, as Jennifer mentioned, her organization was doing these seed bombs, and I I loved it because we were just doing stuff together on Zoom, even if we weren't in the same physical space. And I encourage everyone to start, you know, to host events yeah. that are not just social events, right? Like Samuel's garage sale is a great example of like a, an event that's not only social, it is a little like consumeristic perhaps, but like it's also a re, it's a reuse recycle event, which is amazing. And so it's like, I think having ways to engage where people don't just talk is really important to think about. Um, because I think that also builds on like another thing that was coming up as we were talking is, I don't know, we've been using the word audience a little bit and it, it kind of made me feel a little bit uncomfortable because I think it's less about, you know, building an, a neighborhood audience and more building the neighborhood community, right? And thinking about like, how do we kind of co-create this neighborhood together? Um, kind of what Jennifer was saying earlier about finding the gifts. So instead of deciding what the event should be before, um, really knowing who's part of the event, but getting, as, as everyone's talked about, get to know the neighbors first, understand their needs and their gifts and, and how, what kind of events they might want to might want to host um one thing that comes up in in like a lot of the conversations i've had is especially for folks who want to engage maybe maybe some younger folks or something um 
like I've, I've talked to a lot of um, kind of folks like millennials, Gen Z types, and a lot of them have a lot of really interesting ideas they want to do, but they're not totally sure how to do that. And so they, they might try to attend like a neighborhood association event or different kinds of formal meetings or city council meetings. And they know that's, they just know that that's not the place. And then they don't know where to put their energies. So trying to create spaces or ways for folks to share their ideas um, so that, and like kind of give them the tools to be able to enact those ideas themselves, I think can, can lead to a lot, also just less work for everyone else <laughs> um, on this call. So I, I'm just saying that because I, I don't know, I used to do, um, or I still do some, I still do some consulting work with different neighborhoods and um, doing like listening circles, focus groups, stuff like that. And people are expressing, you know, like a, being tired of just talking and they want to, they want action. So if there's ways to invite them in to like do their, to do action, I think that that will um, engage them more. Well, and thank you for picking up on that use of the word audience. Uh, that That's a good observation about the, you know, the words we choose have meanings, right? And give us a uh, different idea, influence our ideas of how we approach people. So uh, thanks for that tug to get, to get us back in the right direction on that. We know what you meant. Easy. I'm follow. not trying to like call you out or anything. <laughs> <laughs> easy but, to fall yeah. into that trap for sure. You think about that. And, and you're right. People that live around you, they don't want to, they don't want to be a project either. Mm. You know, if you're organizing or putting something together and and it comes off like you're wanting to fix them <laughs> or they're your uh, project of the month, uh, that that doesn't help either. You don't don't want to come off with that sort of approach or vibe at all. Um, that sometimes that sometimes can happen, I think, unintentionally even. But well, we've we've. Uh, droned on um, that's not the right word we've chatted on uh, as a panel here for quite a while I, but i know class members have probably got to have questions and we're wrapping up at 8 15 so uh anybody with a question jump in here please i think other people are still on the on the call so uh the zoom meeting I see a lot of engaged faces, so I do appreciate appreciate that. I'm an <laughs> alumni, so I was in class last fall, um, and I also had my video off a lot because my kids would be dancing around me. So I also appreciate those of you with video off that I know are also engaged. <laughs> but it is easier as a panel for those videos that are on and uh, the engagement there. So, yeah. This maybe this means we've answered all the questions, but. I want to be sure and allow time for people to jump on if you <coughs> unmute. I'm still processing. <clears throat> well, that's. Well, so I'm going to ask a question um, for our KC cohort in general. We were talking earlier about um, engaging a whole neighborhood that's a large group of people. So, you know, 4,000 homes, for example. Um, how would you start that process? What might you suggest to, you know, because you can't engage 15,000 people all, you know, immediately like that. So how would you kind of get that going? And what would you, how would you compartmentalize that process? Who wants to jump in on that one there? Jennifer, Deborah, Sandy? I'm always ready to jump in, but I might not be the best one. So <laughs> Deborah, Samuel, thoughts? Well, you maybe... know, uh... Oh, go ahead, Samuel. Yeah. Well, well, I was just going to say, uh, you know, I, I live in a cul-de-sac with is within a neighborhood, and I'm not exactly sure how big the neighborhood is in terms of numbers, uh, but there is a uh, community center that's nearby, and uh, there is an organized neighborhood uh, center uh, or neighborhood organization that engages the community on a, I think it's a monthly basis. And uh, I haven't been as engaged with the overall neighborhood association, but uh, particularly my neighborhood, I'm very close to. But uh, your, your question was, how do you engage with uh, like a 4,000 uh, household neighborhood? You know, you know that that may take some work. 
Uh, I'm sure you all have something in common in as far as the part of town that you live in or the part of the city that you live in. And uh, there, there's probably uh, some type of neighborhood uh, community center where you gather uh, perhaps from time to time. And uh, sometimes there are probably bulletin boards there where folks are posting information about what they're doing. And uh, so if it's not an organized neighborhood, uh, surely there's something that you could probably consider starting in your area. I would think that with that size of a group, uh, there has to be some type of focus uh, going on uh, for that uh, size of a, a neighborhood. Deborah, you were going to jump in. Yeah, well, I I want to I want to build on what Samuel just said, and um, and I think there's there's kind of a bigger question here, GK, around what you what do you mean by engagement, right? Um, because there's so many different types of engagement um that that you could be talking about. You could be talking about like having everyone again, like maybe follow what you're doing and you could like share with them the information. Are you talking about people attending events? Are you talking about people organizing events? Are you talking about people becoming, all 4,000 people becoming neighborhood leaders at some point? Um, there's so many different levels of engagement that we could be striving for. So I'd be curious to hear more on that. But to build on Samuel's point, like, um, Samuel, I loved your, your when you were talking about your cult fact. I think it, it sounds like such a special place. And um, when I think about building communities, right, it's like, it's it's kind of like that fractal experience, right, where you have maybe, it's like Samuel's cul-de-sac, or Samuel is the first visual, and then Samuel's cul-de-sac, and if there's a strong kind of social cohesion there, then when they approach, like, another neighborhood, other people are like, oh, I like the energy here, I like the vibe, I want to join in and be part of this too, right? And then the the kind of growth to the next, next layer, and then maybe they go to the, like, more bigger parts of Springfield and then start kind of building that out. But it kind of starts, I think, with just uh, to me like a core group and making sure that that core group relating to each other well so that others are just keen to, to also join in. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like how I see this neighborhood leadership program, to be honest. It's like getting that nice vibe amongst all of y'all and then all your neighbors will want to join in too. Yeah. Jennifer, did you want to, I know, I know some communities have used approaches of like block captains, street captains, things like that, board, board people where they're already engaged and then they take on that ownership of their block or their street to reach a larger neighborhood. Yeah, I think it's, I, I think that's, that's a common and a good approach. I think starting with, you know, who is interested and then kind of figuring out your context from there. So, you know, some sort of call to action, let's put it out there for the 4,000 households or the, <laughs> and uh, see who comes and then start talking about what are the opportunities here. Um, we have curriculum that can help with that kind of conversation. I'm sure other people do as well, um, but just to kind of, you know, look at, look at some assets specifically around that group, breaking it down in smaller pieces um, to, to build that engagement, like Deborah said, uh, looking for what's already there, um, like, like Samuel said, I think is good. Um, yeah. So I, I don't have anything more than that, but yes, right. I, I would, I would think about right. breaking it down a little bit. I think I see one other hand raised, uh, George Lovan, go ahead there with your question and then we'll, uh, wrap up. Well, uh, my question would be um, if you were to engage a neighborhood of, let's say, 4,000 people with block captains or neighborhood leaders, things of that nature, um, how would you continue the process on? Because some of those block captains or neighborhood leaders that step up to take on that task could be seniors, they could be older people, things like that, and everything is going great. But at some point, that greatness could start to fall back to a point that you don't want it to because those people can no longer handle the task. Because now we're going back to things that we taught we were speaking of earlier, Digital divides, the communication, things like that. Uh, 
and we're moving into areas where things are now becoming more and more technical and everything doesn't have that so when you build up that block or you start that association with that large group of people what do you put in place about who the torch is going to be passed to yeah how do you do it well you you've just asked the hundred thousand dollar question uh that much debate has gone into uh i'm Jennifer, Deborah, Samuel probably all have something to add add to that or ideas. Take take a swing, take a quick swing. <laughs> yeah, my my first thought is, I mean, you're you're exactly right. This is a it's a a great question. Um, there's probably not just one answer um, to that because there's a couple layers there. Um, but the one thought that came to my mind is that a clear purpose for your black captain will help that. Um, so you had, if you have a clear purpose for like, why do you have a black captain and what is their job? It's easier for someone to commit um, the right amount of time, the time that they have um, to know what to do. It's easier for them to pick a successor. I've, I've seen some of these efforts that are just kind of like, okay, well, sure, I'll be black captain, but now what do I do? <laughs> like, or is it for a party? Is it for communication? Um, and so really understanding what that purpose would be then will help you fit find the right people. It'll help you find the right next person. And it'll help you figure out what level of technology skill do they need to have? What, you know, what, what, um, what do I need to equip them with? What is really necessary to do that particular job? So some clarity around what the purpose is and uh, what the need, what the uh, needs and the person are, I think would, uh, is a one step in helping kind of solve some of the problems that you mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, I've got a uh, just some quick input. Um, I don't know how other cities are designed, but here in Springfield, uh, our, we have neighborhoods all over the city. And uh, with our city government, we have city council members. And each of those council members are over a specific zone, which includes neighborhoods. And I would suggest uh, for the gentleman who asked the question, perhaps getting with uh, a city council member or someone uh, within the city government who uh, has uh, a very clear focus on that specific area of your city and start there in terms of engaging with some questions about uh, what are some of the priorities, what are some of the questions that have been asked. Um, usually those our city council members field lots of questions and deals with a ton of information from their communities on a weekly basis. So I think that might be a good starting point. Okay, and that is a very excellent point. And with that in mind, how do you deal, that, deal with that when that um, elected official doesn't really wanna be engaged? Or I won't say they don't want to be engaged. They push back against those block captains, those leaders who are more engaged in the everyday conversation versus themselves. They only pop out when it's time to get the vote and do things to be seen. Vist saying one of the key strategies that I think I learned uh, in various aspects of real life, but also was really brought home at Neighborhood Leadership Academy. So I'm sure you've heard this before, um, but that is there is real power in this idea of asset based community development. Mm -hmm. And there's there's power in it because it's engaging to your neighbors. It's also engaging to your government officials. <laughs> So if you're meeting with people to discuss problems and to discuss how you're going to solve a problem, not only can that be discouraging, um, people will get fired up about it and they will talk to you about it for sure. <laughs> if you go to their door and be like, what problems do you see here? You will get a list, no doubt. But then you leave and they feel yucky about the neighborhood. They feel 
irritated about the conversations and the problems, and they're not necessarily wanting to fix them because fixing problems is hard is work, right? Fixing problems is work. <laughs> and if you call up a government official and you're like, we've got a list of problems, we'd like some help fixing, that's work. Um, but if you stay asset based and it be, doesn't mean to ignore problems or needs, but if you're thinking about opportunities, that's engaging. If you have a conversation about opportunities, people see it might be a little slower to get started, but they leave the conversation feeling hopeful. They leave the conversation feeling like, well, I, I can do that little thing. You call up a government official and say, we've got, we've got some real cool things happening in your district or your near, you know, your circuit or whatever, whatever your all your, <laughs> your, your division. Right. And we'd like to tell you some things about it and see if you'd like to be engaged with us in making it happen. Well, now, first of all, that helps them get elected. So they're all about that. That's not work. That's fun, <laughs> you know? And now, so I think there's just, there's so many reasons why asset-based development work works um, that I, I just didn't mention, but engagement is one of the key ones at all levels, the influencers, the stakeholders, the everyday people. When you're inviting them into an opportunity, it can solve a problem, but somehow it's just knee jerk for us to think about it in a problem um, a problem way when we go to organize things. So just keep challenging yourself to say, what opportunities exist? How do I build on the assets? Because that it's just more gate. It's more hopeful. More people will get involved and it'll be more positive. Their follow through will be better as well. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Most definitely. The soapbox. <laughs> well, oh, yeah, most definitely. But uh, again, it's still, yeah, it's still going to happen. You, You're right. With, no, with what you said, when you take that to them in that matter, in, in that manner that, mm -hmm. hey, this is going to help you. This is going to benefit you. Mm -hmm. These great things that we're trying to bring to you is going to be a positive reflection on you. Mm -hmm. That elected official still pushes back. Mm -hmm. They want no involvement. <laughs> Someone, someone in the chat says run for that office. I love that. <laughs> I love that. And I, I mean, I think that's true. Like you can only do so much, right? You can leave, you can give people an opportunity. Um, but at the end of the day, if that it's a great suggestion to invite them into the process. And if they don't want to, you still have neighbors who do, you still have some people who do. So just stay encouraged and, uh, you know, wait, wait for that next person or look for someone else. We don't have to have the government to have opportunity um, to, to build on opportunities. It's great when we can all work together. But if it's a dead end, you know, just stay encouraged and find where that open door is. Basically, they get upset when they didn't think of it first. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the human nature. <laughs> gets in our way. Deborah, you want to, did you want to add something to finish this off here? We'll make this the final, final word and hand it back to Elizabeth. Oh, final world for it's a, a very serious <laughs> role to be in. <laughs> um, I do want to plus one on everything Samuel and Jennifer said. I think, um, I think by being a role model and trying to see the, the good intentions of someone else, they might, they might learn from that and try to do the same for you, maybe. Um, and I think trying to think about how do we how do we move from, like, I think one thing I learned from my research with block stewards is that you might wanna think about shifting from a role of, of block stewards as like these single people who are gonna do everything into thinking more like block stewardship, more as like a noun, more as a verb where it's like, how do we just spread that all across where people are just all doing little things together um, and where we are trying to make sure that it doesn't feel like we're trying to centralize power in a certain way, right? Because I think we see that with the local government and that's why um, many of us might express some frustrations about it because it seems like it's all about trying to just centralize that power when we should just try to share it. So I don't know if that really helps, George. I think it would be interesting to, I think, maybe have like a, a longer session with you. You sounds like a very specific situation um, that you're going through right now. And yeah, I, it, I, wish it, you, I wish you compassion. Yes, <laughs> it, it, it is a very specific situation and it, it relates um, to multiple angles. So 
uh, I, I just wanted to put that question out there because uh, that was a good um, session right there. Yeah. Well, thank thank you very much. Thank you to our three panelists for participating, for sharing their knowledge and uh, and a rapid fire questions that we had and kept them hopping. And thank, thank you. you. Thank you to everybody.